Today on the Mr. Maple Show, we interviewed legendary nurseryman Talon Buckholtz. Hey guys, welcome to the Mr. Maple Show. I'm Matt. And I'm Tim. And we've got a killer interview for you today. I was so excited to, get, to do this interview. I know Matt was too. I know Wesley and Brian were geeking out about this as well. Uh, it was very serendipitous. Uh, we had some speakers that didn't make it to the conference we were at for the Maple Society. And we kind of pulled off the Hail Mary by leaving that spot open. Uh, we had uh, asked Mr. Buckholtz for an interview and we did an impromptu interview at the end of the Maple Society meeting in one of the speaker spots. So bear with us. We have a live studio audience for this interview. And uh, we were on location at the Maple Society event. We actually interviewed him in the hotel after one of the presentations. Uh, we left everything open, and uh, it was kind of serendipitous. Everything worked out amazingly. And we did a, a, you know, a live interview there with Talon. The entire Maple Society was listening. A lot of people told me it was their favorite part of the weekend. Um, we were just honored to be able to pull this off. So I hope you enjoy our interview with Talon Buckholz. Yeah, this is something that was just so cool. I mean, to be able to go in and interview Talon and be live on location right. at an International Maple Society meeting in Raleigh, North Carolina right. as the final speaker spot. It, it was really one of those things that was amazing. And then to get to talk to Talon about all the cool things we got mm -hmm. to talk to him about. I don't want to ruin anything for you when you're listening, but there's some really cool things we get to talk to him about today. He really opened up and got personal with us in a way that you candidly don't even get to hear from Talon Buckholtz. Uh, he's one of those legendary guys. He's on my Mount Mush Rushmore for Plantsman. And uh, it was just a special thing for us to get to sit down and talk with him. And uh, we really hope you enjoy this. Uh, definitely take a second and subscribe to us on all major podcast platforms. You can find the Mr. Maple Show anywhere where podcasts are found, pretty much any of your major providers. You can also catch the Mr. Maple Show on YouTube. We air these episodes uh, in premieres every Sunday night at 8 p.m. So you can hop in that chat, be part of that premiere going on. Uh, I think the premiere is going to go a little wild for this one. Yeah, so y'all hope y'all enjoy this. Today we have a guy who really needs not much introduction. If you're into Japanese maples, you already know who Talon Buckholtz is. Uh, we have legendary nurseryman Talon Buckholtz. Happy to be here. Talon Buckholtz is the owner of Buckholtz and Buckholtz Nursery in Gaston, Oregon. His nursery has introduced the Floral Wonder Collection, things from Geisha Gone Wild to Yellow Threats. There's, he's got the Ghost series. He's got First Ghost, Amber Ghost, Purple Ghost. When you're a maple collector, the name Buckholtz is one of those names that is in high rapport with you. This is a nursery and a man that has introduced so many amazing plants that Matt and I, I think the very first time we met Talon, we had a poster from visiting his place. And we, we actually played rock, paper, scissors in the lobby to see who was brave enough to go up and get this thing autographed. So <laughs> we still have that, and we would still get that autographed today. We're, we're, we're that impressed. And uh, when, we, when we started doing this podcast, we're just a few episodes into this, the most requested thing. Everybody said, please talk to Talon. Like he is, the, the collectors are, are enamored with you. Uh, you've got a, a big following, whether you, uh, you know, let them in or not. They love to, to hear a, just little tidbits. So I appreciate uh, uh, that part today. So, so Talon, I, we know a little bit about your nursery because I've, we're good friends. I, I call and talk to you, and I, I love having those conversations with you. But whenever you started out your nursery, you told me before that you purchased land. Was it from Vertree's sister? Yes, I did. Um, by just coincidence, uh, his his sister owned the property that became the nursery, and uh, uh, I didn't know that at the time. I didn't know who she was uh, after I met uh, 
Mr. Vertries, he, he informed me of that, and so it was a surprise to me. Seemed like, almost like I was meant to be growing maples or something. <laughs> <laughs> How was that connection with Vertries? Was he, was he an open guy? Was he somebody warm to you? Was it somebody you had a good relationship with? He was known to be cantankerous, and, um, but for me, he never was. And he was very uh, generous with his time. He knew I knew nothing. Um, one example was uh, uh, speaking a little Spanish and knowing a little Latin. Um, I, didn't, I didn't use the word acer. I called it acer. And he kind of smiled and he said, well, acer. And um, later I found out that uh, really the proper Latin name would be pronounced acer. So maybe I was more right than he was. But <laughs> at the time, I just, you know, I, I felt like a total idiot. And, and, uh, but he, he put up with me and was very generous with his time. You say that he's, you know, I remember you talked about going down and visiting him. And one of his friends showed up. And then he told, went and said hey to his friend, but then said, you know, this man drove from a long way. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be spending the time with Talon because... You know, he drove from a long way, even though his friend from long lost friend from high school had just pulled up in the parking lot. And I thought that was really cool. Is there anything specifically with Veritrees that you that what, what would you say is probably the one of the most important things that Veritrees impressed upon you or that you learned from from J.D. Veritrees? Well, he one one thing is don't don't go out and naming plants without proper evaluation, which I disregarded that uh, <laughs> advice, <laughs> and uh, so he, he was kind of guilty of that too. So don't don't think it's not contagious to start naming things and throwing them out there. Um, but um, I, I I don't know. I think that uh, um, just he kind of had a stern. Um, authoritative demeanor about him and it was it was sort of uh, like you, you better behave is <laughs> is what he mainly instilled in me uh, don't don't screw around I've spent a lot of time um, uh, trying to sort out maples and and you know don't don't just jump in and start doing things wildly um, take measured steps and and uh, um, uh, and and that that kind of I don't know I just felt like he was always kind of looking over me. Sadly, um, uh, when he passed away, I felt uh, more you know like I, I felt disappointed because uh, I wanted to show him that I was behaving myself and uh, as much as possible, and that uh, um, you know I wanted to make him proud of uh, the fact that he was generous with his time with me. And that, oddly enough, is some of the ways that we feel when we're talking with you about maples and you're sharing your knowledge and stuff with us, too. I mean, one of the things we love doing is is taking the people like you and Frank Biles and Elizabeth Mundy, who've inst really helped us and encouraged us along and... That's sort of how we feel often. We're just appreciative all the time, for sure. We're, we're so appreciative of getting that time, and we're trying to do our best to uh, show that we're behaving ourselves. Well, I felt sorry for you, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, much like your story, we showed up knowing nothing, so we had a good starting point. Um, so uh, I know some of our other mutual friends that were influential in your early career, like uh, I know your mutual friend Bob Balter, you said, was an influence on you. Uh, are there other nurseries that, that had a, a nurseryman that kind of had an impact on on you when you were starting out? Well, just in general, everybody's been very good, very generous, and um, um, as you say, share because you may lose your tree, and um, so I, I don't know. You kind of caught me off guard with that question as far as other people, but mm -hmm. there's been so many, and um, the late Ed Wood was very generous with me. Mm -hmm. um, boy, there, there's many others. I just don't have a chance to think right now. So I've known this interesting fact that both you, Mark Krautman, and Greg Ballard all started out at the Dutchman. 
Yes, the Dutchman. <laughs> we ask him stories from time to time, so we got a little bit of frame of reference. We thought it was so fascinating that three successful guys were all working at the same place early on. That's just fascinating. That's like hearing you know, all the different guitarists that played for the same band, and you're like, they all went on to be stars, and, and a, certainly you're one of the, the biggest of that. But it was just interesting that y'all were all at the same place at one time. Yes, we were uh, partners in misery there, I guess. Uh, um, nothing against the Dutch, noth- nothing against that individual. He was just old school. And um, um, one time we were repairing a greenhouse because we had a windstorm and the neighbor's walnut tree th- broke glass in the, in the propagating house. And, and um, so me being larger than the Greg Ballard, <laughs> I was the one handing up the glass panes and he was up on top uh, if if the safety <laughs> police saw him up there we would all have been thrown in jail but um, so I asked uh, the Dutchman I won't use his name but um, uh, he was just old school kind of guy and I said why why don't we just use Polly why do we have to uh, um, you know, repaired the glass, and he, he just looked at me like I was the biggest fool on earth and said that uh, you cannot propagate in a poly house. It must, it must be glass. You know? <laughs> and so, and, um, but the, the fact is I had already started my nursery when I was working for him, and I, would, I, just, I just kept quiet because I didn't want to argue with him. And, uh, but I went home and on weekends and at night I propagated maples and conifers in my poly house and they did quite well. It was pointless to tell him that he was wrong because he was never wrong. Uh, his, his theory was if you're not Dutch, you're not much. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you've told me before uh, a little bit about, you know, it's, it's interesting in this, this time frame because like you were uh, grafting and tell me a little bit about Talon the grafter when you were production. Did, did you enjoy that part of the process and, and grafting and yields and all that part of it? Actually, um, uh, it, you know, when I, it was work, of course, but to, to me it was enjoyable work. Um, I would graft and, and, until 11 or so at night, come home from work and, and then graft. I was the only one. I was the only employee, so I, I had to be the one who did it. And um, but when you're there uh, by yourself, grafting was w- the most peaceful times of my life. And um, uh, one person asked me once if I could recommend, you know, books that would would help. And uh, and I I I recommended a book that surprised him. It was called. Uh, Zen in the Art of Archery, <laughs> of all things, uh, where uh, it was written by a Westerner who went to Japan and um, tried to master the, 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 the archery um, skills of the master archers with these big, enormous bows. And um, basically, the harder you try, the, the more you'll fail. <laughs> And you just have to let go and just do it. And um, to make a long story short, and and so I enjoyed that process. It was it was the best part of my life, really. And I'll be honest, I I've shown people how to graph since then, and I'm kind of awkward because I I haven't done much. But as far as production goes, I haven't grafted anything um, for the last f- 15, 20 years. I've I've just never touched the knife other than to briefly show somebody how to do or how to begin to do it, and then they had to find their own way with it. But, um, yeah, it, it, was, it was just a, a matter of, uh, um, you know, well, getting in tune with, with the plant you're dealing with. Every right. sign's different, every rootstock's different, and, and you just have to kind of, like, you, they almost match themselves. You just have to, like, be there to... to to tie them up and I wanted to ask about it. I know you know you've you've moved on from the production for sure, but it's such an intimate time for a grafter starting out and I'm, getting into these processes. I, I know and Matt and I would sit around and we'd just turn on some music and just be sitting there talking, geeking out, talking about plants. Some of the plants we're grafting and some of the plants we wanted to graft that we didn't have, and just sit. We would just sit down and talk for hours about 
where we wanted to go to get Steinwood, what we wanted to do. And it was just me and Matt geeking out together. Probably when I do my most learning about a cultivar, because I study every aspect of it, to think, you know, while I'm grafting, I'm sitting there thinking about that one thing. But Well, even today, the... Um most of the sign wood, almost all of the sign wood, unless it's you have to climb up a ladder, and I'm a three-step guy. I don't want to go above the third step. But um, uh, all the sign wood I still collect, and that uh, is enjoyable very much as well, is, is that's when you really get to know your tree and what to, what to look for. That's hard to pass on. Um, I've, I've said before that I can teach a monkey how to graft, but... Um, you know, the, the sign selection and the aftercare, all those things are, are really more important than the physical act of grafting. Uh, are there any advice you would give? That was actually a question I had as a follow-up question for you was um, the importance of selecting the scion. Is there any advice you would give on that? And You, you know, I, I've seen things that amaze me. I've, I've seen Europeans with uh, their, their methods, um, uh, the Dutch in particular, and uh, they, t- they take sign wood that would fail for me, but in their climate, um, th- they, they graft on in, in late, late uh, summer, early fall, they graft and they cover it with thin poly and they're on heat cables or something. And, and I don't do any of that, and, and, uh, but they get away with things that uh, wouldn't work for me. So that's an important lesson: is that uh, you got to find what works in your climate and and um, with your particular sign wood and so forth. And I have I have what works best for me. And then, if I really want to get, you know, for example, uh, a, a rare variety that I want to do as many of as possible, then I'll start using a lesser quality sign wood and. Sometimes I'm right, then nothing worked there. It was a waste of time. But other times they all take even better, <laughs> so you, you just don't know. And uh, you have to be pretty humble to accept what happens. It's just, um, and, and um, I, I've had propagators tell me how I, I, I get 99% or something, and it's like, well, I don't think you get 99%. Right. But, Oddly uh, specific sometimes. Yeah, and, uh, but then what are you doing? You're doing some easy things, and, and, uh, w- but everybody seems to want what's more difficult to produce, and, um, and there's a reason they want it because they can't get it anywhere else. But, um, and so you, it's a hit and miss. Some, some years it does well, some years it doesn't. So speaking about different cultivars, you've introduced some of the most sought-after selections of Japanese maples. Um, I know that Mina Malad, who was here, he said, if you get to interview Talon, make sure to ask him, how does he come up with these different selections? How does he find these different selections? And so I, I, I've got to ask, Talon, what, how, do you, how do you find these different selections and what kind of process do you go through and when you're evaluating them? Uh, by not searching for anything. <laughs> <laughs> you, you just encounter what you encounter and, and, um, and probably um, a, a lot of worthy things have been just cast aside. One of the new plants you mentioned uh, today, wave leaf, didn't make the grade at first. And a lot of times we have seedling select or seedlings from named varieties and uh, we pot them up and we watch them and and then we say you know that that's pretty pretty nice let's let's keep that wave leaf was not one of those it didn't make the grade and um, then i would sell those as just seedlings from named varieties and uh, uh, one customer or more of a friend than a customer he saw the wave leaf seedling it was named wave leaf because that it, it has kind of a undulating uh, leaf surface, but um, and he was really taken with it, and and then suddenly I started seeing it differently, <laughs> and and I thought, well, maybe I better be propagating this first, then give it away, <laughs> and um, so it, you know. But if if you if you go out searching, well, I have a skill that uh, that I'm actually kind of proud of more than uh, propagation or, or horticulture and. I just have this knack for finding four-leaf clovers, and um, most people just 
my children even just uh, how do you do it well I n- I've never looked for one but I what I kind of seek out is or, or I instinctively notice what's wrong and so a four-leaf clover is wrong they're, they're not supposed to have four they're supposed to have three right and so uh, my eye just seems to, to latch on to what's different and um, um, I'm the only person in my company that finds nails on the road because nobody else cares. And, but nails are bad. They're wrong. They cost me money. They're flat tires. They're inconvenient. And so I, I'm pretty good at finding those too. And um, so I think with, um, you know, you just, you kind of, you, you might notice a, a broom in something. You might notice a, a leaf that attracts you. Um, the variety Bronze Age just, I'm surprised that was ever selected, um, but somehow I just it it twinkled at me at the right time and uh, one spring and I just I kind of fell for it and and then there's nothing more gratifying than having other people say well I really like that too it's one of my wife's favorites and uh, and she said wow that's really great that's really great uh, uh, how did you get that well I found it you know and, and it's it just uh, it's 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 kind of a fun thing, but you you shouldn't be um, seeking anything. You shouldn't be too arrogant about anything. Mm-hmm. You just uh, um, just let it happen, and and uh, and and you as you guys know, you're getting a lot of new things from from uh, different people, and and so I'm not the only one that does this. Your, your humility with us has been just, I mean, just to even take the time has been amazing. And one thing I'll say that just made me smile a little bit there. And uh, Tim, as a kid, would be like, he would come up with, maybe it's an attention to detail thing. Four-leaf clovers were his thing. He would show up with tons of these things, too. But maybe it's that, like, looking for the odd one in the group. Um, uh, An an interesting question I'd love to ask you. Uh, You're certainly famous for conifers. Uh, Maples have become, you know, super famous for you. Was there a moment that you kind of realized Maples? Was there a moment that it was like, hey, Maples are going to, kind of be my my calling card my passion well I never had anything planned I, I never really wanted a nursery I, I wanted to be independently wealthy but that didn't <laughs> <laughs> that didn't work out and um, but the nursery was the the means to to collect plants so I just wanted to grow plants and collect them and somehow uh, pay the mortgage and put food on the table and um, so it, it just kind of happened that way, and uh, um, you know, and, and I I would say that um, my first encounter with, well, to me, maples were red lace leaves, and I guess there was a green variety called Verides or something. I don't know, and um, and then I really didn't even know a grafted like a grafted selection like Bloodgood versus. Uh, just a red seedling. I really didn't even understand any of that. I was working for a wholesale nursery before the Dutchman and uh, they grew a few maples and and um, but then I encountered in the late 70s uh, the Vertries um, Japanese maple book and as I paged through that I I guess that's what hooked me was was just seeing oh my goodness there's variegated varieties there's all all kinds of things and uh, leaf shapes and colors and and uh, at the time, um, I thought that book was just um, a, an amazing source of inspiration. And then, as we said before, the uh, the chance connection I had with Vertries um, sort of sealed the deal on that. And, and the other thing is the the, nur- uh, the nursery. The first nursery I worked at was an enormous wholesale nursery uh, that eventually went bankrupt. And um, uh, and you might look at that two ways. I, I'm the one who caused it to go bankrupt, or or it went bankrupt because I was no longer there. I, <laughs> I prefer the latter. <laughs> but um, but I so I got big big nursery out of my my system. I didn't need to have a big nursery growing tons of what we call commodity plants, um, box store type plants. Mm-hmm. And um, so in order to survive, because I had no money at all. To survive, I had to do something that nobody else was doing, and um, and and I was self-taught on grafting, and I don't know, I didn't succeed very well either. My <laughs> my first years and kind of 
somehow it stumbled into the way that it worked for me. But it was uh, it was just kind of a you know I, I was just I don't know I was just uh, really not a, a good provider for the family in the in the fact that I suddenly um, am a nurseryman and uh, no matter what how much snow we're getting or frost or heat or anything else I had to make it work so there's a lot of pressure um, but somehow I look back and and uh, uh, 43 years later here I am with you guys <laughs> uh-oh <laughs> sorry about that so whenever it comes to introducing new selections you we know that you will sometimes go through different types of seedlings and look through different types of seedlings from ghost types to I've seen, is it Toyama Nishiki or Hanamatoi seedlings you're looking through? What about a tree makes you think, hey, I need to look through these seeds to see if I can find something, to see if there's something interesting, or are you just doing those seedlings because you think that those will sell and you might perhaps find something in those? Well, when I when I plant seed, I've been accused of being a, a plant breeder. Well, I've bred nothing, nothing intentional. The only thing I've ever bred intentionally was my five children, and but um, so I'm not, you know, I'm not intending to to find anything or do anything like that. It's just uh, I'm I'm lazier than you think when it comes to. <laughs> to searching or selecting I, I really don't and um, uh, you know when when my daughters ask me well how do you find these four-leaf clovers I, I say well I don't find them they find me they call out to me and it's the same with the maples you just uh, you kind of know what's already out there you see something that's a little different um, if you're not careful you fall in love with all of them uh, they're all different and um, you know, I mean, whoever tires of another pretty girl, really, you know, and so uh, the maples are kind of the same way. They're, you know, all these that, or a lot of these that you you showed. Well, there's already something similar to it, as you know, and um, but but this one's just a little bit different. Or uh, and, and and then you have to realize that most of the time that you're late or not even um, you're gonna. Why did I even set that aside? You, you know, and because um, time goes on, you see it through the seasons, and and you don't, uh, you realize you just don't really have anything very good. Uh, your purple curl that you like um, could have easily been thrown out, and um, so then I kind of have the uh, market approach. So that we'll let the market decide. But um, and then the reason I put a name on something early. I put a name on it if we're going to propagate it, uh, because then, as you say, a code name can get all mixed up and um, uh, doesn't mean anything. So put a name on it, just whatever comes to your mind. Um, I don't know why Purple Ghost became, or the Ghost series became the Ghost series. It, that just happened. It was almost like somebody was moving me along with, with that. But um, if you really knew how simple uh, and lazy I am, you would you would know <laughs> that I, I don't really set out to do anything. Just things happen. So, what was your very first introduction of any plant? Of any plant, it was uh, <clears throat> Acer palmatum fairy hair, and uh, that was very early on. Um, I collected seed off of something a little bit similar, Scolopendrifolium out of a friend's garden, uh, Dr. Corbin. And uh, he would always just have a bemused smile when I was eagerly collecting seed. And, you know, he, he had no idea <laughs> who what was going to happen with me. But um, I, I found uh, fairy hair in a, uh, came up in a seed flat. And uh, fortunately, it was on the edge of the seed flat so it could thrive. Uh, get a little bit of light because otherwise it would have been swamped out by the other seedlings. On the other side of the seed flat was a red seedling and that eventually became red cloud and a, a, a linear lobum that's there's there's a number of varieties. I only do a few for, for old graft a few for old time's sake uh, but um, I think it's been surpassed by other cultivars 
but um, so that was the first and Red Cloud right along with it was the first and I thought it was amazing that uh, those two came up in the same a seed flat for us has a between 80 and 100 seedlings you don't want more um, because then you really can't evaluate anything but you pot but when I potted up uh, fairy hair I, I didn't give that to anybody I did that myself and um, I thought just by taking that that uh, little delicate little thing out of the seed flat um, it probably wasn't going to survive and um, I accepted that, but I couldn't leave it there either. And um, but fortunately, it lived and uh, grew into a cultivar that we've uh, we've produced a few thousand of. Uh, uh, not easy to grow, or I mean, it's easy to grow, but not easy to propagate uh, because the wood's so tiny. But um, we figured that out too, and and uh, it does fairly well for us. So the follow-up question to that is, I know with Tim and I. Sometimes the one that got away is really cool. So I have to ask you, was there a cultivar that got away or that you lost that you thought, wow, man, that was going to be really cool? And with us, there's always things where it was so interesting and it de-variegated uh, the rabbit <laughs> ate it we, or something. We had a variegated Acer coriacea folium that we'd collected at Stephen of Austin University. And it was pure white, pure white. There were some other seedlings in there that were little splotches of white, but we walked into the greenhouse and a rabbit ran out and we walked over and the Coriacea folium seedling was chopped off at the ground <laughs> yeah, at a time taste. we couldn't graft. <laughs> so that was, that was the one that got away for us, but was there any, anything like that for you? Well, that might have been a blessing, right? <laughs> maybe, maybe, it was a, maybe it was saved us undue failure in the future on that one. Yeah, we've had some, my share of disasters too, but... Um, Nothing really comes to mind because you, you just move on, you know, and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, my, my doctor, um, um, he cares for me, you know, he, he wants me to be healthy and do well, but um, um, I, I told him, he knows what I do for a living, and, and I, you know, and I said that, uh, uh, you know, you, you, you try hard, but uh, even if your tree, if your patient dies, you you get paid anyway. I don't when my tree dies. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> he thought that was kind of funny, but he had to go, oh, you're right. Um, but things that get away, I, I can't, nothing comes to mind except things have gotten away. And um, you just, uh, you just go, well, I, I still, I still have plenty on my plate anyway. So, uh, so you come up with some pretty good jokes over the years. Yeah, I, I do remember this thing on April Fool's Day where you released, was it a blue and a red ginkgo? <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, yes, we, I, I, I thought I played my cards well. Um, <laughs> we, we just color altered a ginkgo close up and, uh, I don't even remember the name uh, that we gave it, but uh, Blue Wonder or some such a name, and um, and so I, I I made a little story about uh, how we'd been watching it for years and kept it in a secluded greenhouse and nobody, you know, finally we're ready to release it and you know they're priced this much and get your order in early and stuff and everybody <laughs> fell for it. <laughs> uh, Who wouldn't and, believe you had this? And and um, I I received orders like n <laughs> <laughs> nobody's business. It was it was put on the, on the floor of Wonder Blog and so there were I don't know people came out of the woodwork for that and. Uh, uh, and, and I actually made an enemy or two because the people ordered it realized they'd been duped. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, they, and one was officially mad enough to cancel his order and, and never s to speak to me again. <laughs> and I, I thought, wow, over an April Fool's joke. And, and um, we, <laughs> we did another one uh, later, but um, it, it's, that was kind of fun. And um, um, yeah, so... I had to throw that in there. It certainly made me laugh really that, hard. That's one thing Matt and I laugh about all the time. We're like, man, he pulled off one of the biggest horticulture, horticulture pranks, pranks. <laughs> that, I, that I've seen someone pull off. And that, that always puts a big smile on our face for sure. So um, I, I, you were asked the question last night by Augustine, 
and you had talked about how your wife viewed plants, and I thought it was one of the most elegant explanations. We're actually at the Maple Society meeting while we're recording this, and you were kind of impromptu to ask about your plans after retiring from the, ma- from the nursery industry, and uh, I'm not going to lie, it hit me in the feels. I thought that was one of the best answers I've ever heard for uh, plans. That, that just really was awesome. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Well, just as I say that uh, I don't find four-leaf clovers, they find me, and I think the future will find me, and uh, I can go in either direction. Uh, You know, there's the old baseball saying, uh, Yogi Berra, I think, that uh, uh, when you come to a T in the road, take it. (laughs) And so left or right, you know, and, and... and like the family dog, you know, he, he just wanted to go out and walk with you. He didn't care if you turned left or turned right or went straight ahead. Um, just uh, he was just happy to be out for a walk. I, I'm looking forward to retiring from crop production, and so I can appreciate and enjoy trees like other people do who aren't in horticulture, who don't make a living with it, um, and maybe take the approach to trees and life and people um, that uh, my wife does and so she's been a, a good role model in that I, I think without your wife this interview wouldn't have happened <laughs> so we, we, we're extremely thankful for Ruko and <laughs> we're extremely extremely thankful for her for sure so I'll tell you one more thing that kind of uh, really endeared uh, us to you as well Uh, In 2013, we had the Maple Society meeting in Asheville, and you came to visit. And uh, we, Tim and I put on uh, a lot of that meeting, obviously, since we were there locally. And uh, if you follow Talon's blog, you know it's no holds bar. Talon tells you what he thinks in there. And so if he has an opinion on a place, he kind of tells you what he thinks. So we took him to some private gardens. He wasn't too fond of them. (laughs) We took him to Biltmore House. He wasn't too fond of it. And so I told Tim, I was like, you can do the math. That was the first day. This was the second day. And like next week, he's probably going to talk about our place possibly. So don't be offended if he says it's garbage, it's trash, it's weedy, everything was mislabeled. We'd, we'd prepared the, for the worst. Just take even, it as a learning experience. Even and, though we and were good friends, yeah. we, we, we just, we, we kind of hardened our hearts to the worst there because it was, you know, we'd like, he might be brutally honest. And uh, honestly, we still take it as one of the greatest compliments we've ever received and will ever receive. Uh, It was one of the kindest uh, accounts of our place anybody had ever said, and it meant a lot to us at the time. I just want you to know, it was in 2013, and it was like, gosh, it was it was so complimentary, and uh, it it really encouraged us a lot. It gave us a lot of encouragement. I really, we really appreciate your kind words. Uh, Uh, Right after that, uh, we we just said thank you to him. And uh, graciously at our house, uh, all the IPPS proceedings, and I'm, I might mess up the years, but from like 1960 to 2013 showed up at our doorstep. And then, and then followed by some handmade books uh, from Japan that people had given you. And that meant a lot to us. And we've been going through that stuff and trying to dig into it and we, we really just want to say thank you so much because I, that meant, really meant a lot to us and still does. And I know that you said at some point, you know, if uh, to find the next maple nuts and pass these along to. And we, we definitely will. <laughs> we definitely will. That, that meant a lot to us, though, especially some of those books because we were just so uh, just taken back that you sent those. And it was just such... Uh, a special thing for us. We have those in a real special place. But uh, whenever it comes to people who taught you in horticulture or people that you looked up to with Japanese maples or even founding fathers, like you would say founding fathers of Japanese maples in America, who would you say would be like your Mount Rushmore of Japanese maples in America? Well, you, you catch me off guard. Right. <laughs> well, <laughs> we go for this thankful thing. And then. You can also say in general, I know you had a huge relationship with Peter and Yano San. Well, you know, and, I, I really did. So many, so many uh, huge guys like at your level. Yeah, no, you're right. And I just, who didn't love Peter Gregory? <laughs> uh, who doesn't love Masayoshi Yano? Um, so, yeah, they're, they're the Rushmores, I guess. Uh, um, 
th- those those I don't know you know it's not like I knew them very well mm-hmm. Vertries or any I I didn't know them that well, um, but but I just uh, they just had a presence about them that uh, I appreciated. Uh, you mentioned Bob Baltzer. He was a, he was a real jokester too, and and uh, he passed away a couple of years ago. And and um, I don't know. You just uh, you just kind of develop friends first, and the the rest comes. Uh, friendship first, and and then then maybe business comes second, or I don't know. But but these are the and there was no business with Yano. There's no business with Peter Gregory. But but um, I I think what what I appreciate the most is is we we were different they were way ahead of me in many ways but uh, but they treated me as an equal and um, which was uh, I really appreciated to that I would say if who doesn't love Yano and who doesn't love Peter Gregory uh, who doesn't love Talon cuz mm-hmm. like he's you know right there on that mount rush more for us too so um Talon is there any advice that you would have for a nursery like us that's young and growing and trying to figure everything out going forward, what would be your best advice for us? Um, take it all in stride and um, the good, the bad, and, and everything that happens, and uh, um, you'll, you'll, have, you'll have significant problems. Um, you know, I, I had some hurdles to, to get over. Um, um, you know, one reason I say my nursery was successful is I didn't have a successful first marriage. And uh, so I escaped from all that and, and, uh, and devoted myself to, the, to the, the business. And I don't recommend either of you to do that. But uh, um, it, it just, uh, you know, you're, you're going to have things happen to mm-hmm. you. And uh, whether it's weather related or the, the, the tornado goes through your place or something. But somehow, you know, when I, um, I there's, there's many times I just have a sick feeling in my stomach about doomsday is around the corner. And, um, and yet, you know, uh, just year after year, just I keep going on and on. And um, uh, so um, I think I, I envy the fact that uh, your two brothers that uh, can work well together, uh, everything from speaking to apparently running a business and... Uh, I kind of had to do that by myself. I envy you for that. And I've known a few other um, um, brothers in horticulture, um, sisters in horticulture too. And um, the ones that can work together, I I really envy that because I felt a lot of times like I was all by myself and um, and dealing with the problems. Um, Hark was supportive, of course, but... um, Sometimes just she's just too nice and gets on my nerves that way. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. I was telling you that a little bit earlier. It was a really hard place for me when I was getting into this too. And it's funny how you know plants can be a real rescue for some of those times, but then also they always come with challenges. There's always that year where you get humbled or, or something something happens. Uh, one thing my wife uh, would definitely say that you gave us advice for that she would think is funny. Talon sent us a wedding gift. And uh, I had a um, this really beautiful piece of art that you'd put on some of the harder work of one of your uh, uh, photography. And the note with it said, make sure to procreate a lot. You're going to need a lot of help. <laughs> and so my <laughs> wife still has that. She thinks that's the greatest. Uh, she thought that was hilarious. And so we've got three now. So we've got a little bit more help. <laughs> but uh, she thought that was just the best uh, note we received at our wedding, just so you know. Well, one other question I want to ask you, too, is just for anyone that might be listening that might be starting out with Japanese maples, um, for someone that is a home gardener who, what would be your advice for someone who is just starting out with Japanese maples, you know, what they should start looking for, what they should look for when they're planting a Japanese maple in their yard? Well, I have, um, first of all, I have five children, and I'm happy none of them want to go into horticulture <laughs> uh, because the challenges are there, and um, I, I, just, I, I, I just have this instinct to make sure they're okay. And um, so, uh, you know, as far as um, um, advice for people is uh, uh, if, if you have any questions, I'll try to answer them. And other than that, you just have to get your hands dirty and do it. And uh, um, 
I, I like the doers. I, I can relate to them. The the the, the people who start with nothing, and um, and and build it all up themselves, rather than the maybe the grower who's or the the nurseryman who's been given a nursery. Um, it, you, I think you you learn and appreciate more if you start from nothing and and just build everything up yourself. And um, you can copy from other people, of course, and you should. And um, that's, you know, just be aware and be open to the fact that uh, uh, you only know a small percentage. So uh, I mentioned that you were one of the most requested people that we talked to on here. Uh, The most requested thing to say to you wasn't really a question. Uh, It was collectors from all of our customers. They said, what would you say to Talon Buckholz? And they said to tell you thank you. And uh, that that's something we definitely, and it, honestly, that is literally what people said to tell you. They were like, do you have a question? They said, just tell him thank you. <laughs> and so uh, we got that over and over again. And I just want to tell you thank you for your generosity with your time here today, but far beyond that, your time you've, you've allowed for Tim and I to ask you questions and just your time in general has been, it's valuable and I thank you for it. You're welcome, and um, you know it's uh, anything that uh, promotes uh, happiness. Uh, if maples do that, all the better. Well, Talon, thank you so much for joining us today. I know everyone here at the Maple Society really enjoyed this interview. I know we did as well, and uh, we couldn't thank you enough for agreeing to sit down and uh, talk with us. I know that you don't do too many interviews, so it, I was really excited that uh we, we got persuaded we, your better half to uh impart for us and, and beg and we begged her to beg you <laughs> so hopefully it worked thank you wow guys i hope you enjoyed that interview with legendary plantsman talon buckholtz you know talon's famous for so many things from the ghost series Uh, to Geisha Gone Wild, to Fairy Hair. I mean, his litany of plants from the Flora Wonder Collection is really unparalleled. If Talon, you know, I almost said this in the interview, if Talon was a musician, you know, he's up there. He's he's got a lot of number one hits, right? I mean, there's he's kind of the Beatles and Elvis (laughs) all rolled into one there. He's got all the number ones. Yeah, for Japanese maples, he's one of the top guys who's introduced so many amazing plants. He's introduced more amazing cultivars into the nursery trade that have became so famous and many people don't even know that right. there were his introductions. Mm-hmm. And so it was such a, an honor to be able to get to interview him, but special thanks to Haruko Buchholz. Yeah. She kind of, she kind of made the whole thing possible. Uh, we really appreciate her. She, uh, she, she was very sweet in uh, encouraging Talon to sit down with us for this interview. And uh, we really imparted on Talon. Talon was talking about in some of his younger days, how he wanted to interview JD Veritrees and we said, well, that's us right now. We want to interview you. You are our J.D. Veritrees, and we would love to spend time with you and just talk to you about, you know, your life. And I thought it was a really candid interview. It was a really good interview by him. Um, you know, Talon uh, is a is an old school guy. He's very stoic sometimes to some people, but he really was sweet and opened up and just showed a side of him. I think a lot of people don't get to see. We've got to see it over the years because he's really been quite kind and given to us with his time and his information. But it was really fun to show other people that side of Talon. And special thanks to the Maple Society, who was a great live audience. They stayed <laughs> extremely quiet during this radio, inter- this you know podcast interview. And so special thanks to them for letting us take that speaker spot right. and get in there and interview Talon. But I know many of them came up to me afterwards and they said, that was my favorite speaker spot throughout the entire conference. It was fun. And it so- was fun. It was our first time ever doing a podcast with a live studio audience. So you can imagine you know, the level of... Uh, Scared there to get everything perfectly right, especially interviewing somebody so important to us as Talon Buckholz. I mean, this was one of the interviews that when we started doing the podcast, everybody said Talon Buckholz. And so to pull it off was a big deal to us. Uh, you know, huge, huge, huge hero to us. And uh, we just couldn't thank him enough for being on the podcast. So, guys, if you like this kind of content, make sure you're signing up for it on any and all major podcast platforms. Give us a five star rating if you like this kind of content. You know, I typically listen to them on Spotify. You can find them on Pandora, uh, you know, iTunes, basically anywhere you listen to to, uh, podcast platforms, it's going to be there. Definitely subscribe it. Give it a five-star rating. That goes a long way to helping other people find it. 
And if you want to see the video component to this, we actually had the cameras going live during this. You can always watch that on the Mr. Maple Show on YouTube. And we air these episodes for the podcast. They air in premieres at 8 p.m. Eastern every Sunday. And we really appreciate y'all listening. Always remember, too, to support this channel. The best thing you can do is shop on MrMaple.com. We're a small mail order uh, business, family business in Western North Carolina, and we ship Japanese maples from our nursery directly to your door. So you can get a lot of really cool plants from us. Do check us out on MrMaple.com. Gosh, I hope a lot of you collectors enjoyed this one. You know, we joked we flew too close to the sun. Like, how do you top this? We've already got to Mount Rushmore. We've already got to the pinnacle of the mountain at this point. We've uh, already interviewed some really amazing people. Guys, stay tuned. We've got even more awesome interviews coming up here on the Mr. Maple Podcast. I keep getting shocked by the level of guests we're getting to be here on our show. It just keeps going better and better. Uh, we've had some amazing interviews so far. Uh, episodes that are to come are amazing. Uh, I know the ones that have aired. We've aired Steve Bender. You know, we've aired uh, Talon Buckholtz, obviously, if you're listening to this episode. Uh, we've actually uh, interviewed Tom Cox uh, at the Cox Arboretum. Uh, we've had some just really cool stuff lined up in the future for you guys as well. I think you're really going to want to be a part of this podcast, so stay tuned. There's some big secrets and some fun ones to come as well. And we really appreciate you all watching on YouTube. If the people are watching this live on YouTube, if you're watching this live on YouTube, get in the live chat and tell us who you think else we should interview or other podcast ideas. We'd really appreciate it. Everyone listening out there, we appreciate y'all so much. Take care. God bless. And have a great day.